What is up ladies and gents, this is George Bean, and with Christmas coming this month, I thought it'd be good to review a certain horror film set during that holiday. That being the 1974 psychological slasher film, Black Christmas, which was directed by Bob Clark, written by Roy Moore, and starring Olivia Hussey, John Saxon, Marco Kidder, and Kier Duella. Upon its release uh, on October the 11th of 1974 in Canada and December the 20th in the United States under the title Silent Night, Evil Night, the film had initially received a somewhat mixed response from critics, such as Gene Siskel who gave it 1.5 stars out of 4 and called it a routine shocker. One critic from the New York Times had called it a whodunit that raises the question as to why it was it made. But soon after its release, the film had received more critical praise, with film historians noting it for being one of the earliest slasher films to conclude without revealing the identity of, the, of its villain, as well as serving as an influence on John Carpenter's Halloween in 1978. And aside from a strong cult following since its release, it had received the novel, uh, ended up receiving two remakes of the same name, one which was released in uh, December 2006, and the other which is to be released just this Friday, which I will discuss about soon in this video. The plot, the story follows a group of sorority sisters having decided to spend their Christmas break staying at their sorority house. But as their Christmas begins, the girls begin receiving strange and obscene phone calls from a stranger, and as the day progresses, it doesn't take long before they slowly realize that they are unsuspectingly being murdered one by one by a deranged unknown killer who has been stalking the sorority house for some time. This film was written as a spec script written by Canadian writer Roy Moore back when he had used to work in the Canadian broadcast system. The script, originally titled The Babysitter, which was about a young girl who, while babysitting a neighbor's children, receives threatening phone calls with psychosexual intentions from a deranged killer, was not only inspired by the urban legend The Babysitter and The Man of Stairs, but also what Moore had once claimed to be a series of murders that took place in the Westmount section of Montreal during Christmas time. This claim by Moore has been a major subject of debate, as apparently there have been no such reports of murders in Montreal like that. But this is something we may possibly or not get any more information about, especially given that Roy Moore had passed away in 1980. When the script had reached the intent attention of producers Harvey Sherman and Richard Schouten, they had hired Timothy Bond to rewrite the script to give it a university setting, thus focusing the story on sorority girls, and changed the title to Stop Me, before they had given the script to, to their choice of director, Bob Clark. And this is based on my having read any and all information concerning the film and its script. But according to Bob Clark himself, in the script, the death scenes were much, much more graphic and gory. And most of all, it was to actually reveal the identity of the killer. So upon signing on as director, Clark had opted to rewrite the script as he had apparently felt that the script was too much of a straightforward slasher film. So with that, he had decided to, on adding more humor into it, making the death scenes less graphic and instead be implied, and most of all, make the bold decision in not revealing the killer's identity. At first, writer Roy, Roy Moore was against these changes, but upon seeing the film, he became happy with the, with the result. And here's another interesting fact. When they were preparing to, the film for its American release in 1975, Warner Brothers, studi uh, the studio executives there, had asked Clark to change the concluding scene to show 
Claire's boyfriend, Chris, appear in front of Jess and say, Agnes, don't tell them what we did before killing her, thereby revealing Chris to be the killer. However, Clark had insisted on keeping the ending ambiguous. And something else too, but back in 1978, the NBC channel had planned to schedule this film for debut on TV on January the 28th of 1978 under the title Stranger in the House. But on January 15th, just two weeks before this film's premiere, TV premiere, a home invasion occurred on a Florida State University sorority house, which had left two female students murdered and two others injured. After the incident, NBC had received numerous pleas from locals to pull the movie from broadcast, and so NBC had decided to do so, and the film Doc Savage, Man of Bronze, was shown instead. They would later run Stranger in the House as a late movie on May 14th the same year, and also the perpetrator of the sorority house spree was later identified as serial killer Ted Bundy, who earlier that month had escaped from a federal state prison in Colorado. In 2006, this film had been given a remake of the same name, which was written and directed by Glenn Morgan of Final Destination fame. The remake had received a negative reception, but it becomes more in interesting when you read about its behind-the-scenes info. According to Cecil of Good Bad Flicks, Morgan had initially written the remake to be much more of a bloodless, slow-burning psychological thriller like the original film, much to Bob Clark's enthused approval. But then halfway through filming, executive producer Harvey Weinstein, yeah that bastard, had showed up on set and demanded the film include more slasher film elements, such as more gorier deaths. And I honestly wouldn't be surprised if it, if it was he who suggested including the incest scene into the film. So what would have been a bloodless slow burner had been butchered into a typical mundane slasher film, much to Morgan's dismay and frustration. After the remake had flopped, Bob Clark had stated that he was planning to make a sequel to the original film, but unfortunately in 2007, he, along with his son, had died in a car crash caused by a drunk driver, killing all possible chance of the 1974 film ever getting a sequel. But that doesn't stop there because yet another remake is now scheduled to be released just this Friday on December 13th of 2009, uh, 2019. This new remake, also titled Black Christmas, is being produced by Jason Blum and starring Emogen Poots and Carrie Elways. And from what I've seen in the trailers, it seems that it will focus on the sorority girls fighting back. Uh, I'll wait and see how the receptions for the new movie goes, and hopefully see it and get back to you all on that. Now for the cast. This movie has a really interesting cast. Olivia Hussey was pretty decent as sorority girl Jess Bradford. She's okay in this film, she's there to essentially act as the final girl of the movie. Although I do think the Jess character does make some decisions that I see as being questionable. John Saxon was also okay as Lieutenant Kenneth Fuller. His performance in this film is not too dissimilar to his role as Lieutenant John Thompson in A Nightmare on Elm Street. But you do have a chance to root for him in this film, given that he is possibly the only cop in this movie that isn't inept or incompetent. But Margot Kidder does absolutely steal the show as Bob, Barb, an alcoholic sorority girl, and Jess's friend. She was really great as a drunk college girl in this film. She always seems to light up whatever she, scene she appears in. 
this role was just four years she go before she'd go on to play Lois Lane in Superman. It is sad that she had passed away just like a year or two ago. But no matter what, she will always I will always remember her as the best Lois Lane in any and all live action Superman movies. And Kier Delea was pretty good as Peter, Jess's boyfriend. One particularly interesting trivia fact is that he was 38 when he made this movie. So if taking into account that age for his character, Peter, then that would make him older than his girlfriend, Jess, by at least 20 years. But still, Kier does pretty good in his role here. He is obviously depicted as the prime suspect in the murders in this film, the Red Herring, uh, based on his particularly odd behavior and several clues hinting at him all throughout the film. Now for me, in my personal opinion of, about this film, I had never actually heard of this film up until I had gotten to see the remake in the cinema when I was 13, and thanks to the remake, it had let me get around to looking into the original film, and I got to watch it on YouTube. And at the time of my first viewing, I didn't think too much of it, but over the past few years, Black Christmas has now become one of my personal favorite slasher films, alongside the likes of Halloween and Scream. I love the film for its dread-filled atmosphere, it's whodunit mystery, it's subtle kill scenes, and it's shocking yet impactful ending. It's absolutely shocking to think that this film was directed by Bob Clark, the same guy who would go on to direct the Christmas classic A Christmas Story in 1983. But it does go to show how versatile a filmmaker like of his like can truly be if given a chance. But yeah, when he started his directing career in the early 1970s, he did horror movies such as this, Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things, and Death Dream. And then by the 1980s, he then ventured into comedy with films such like Porky's and A Christmas Story, and would continue to do so into the 2000s with films like Baby Geniuses and its sequel, Super Babies. Now again, on my first viewing, I didn't, didn't think too much of it, but I was a bit stunned and disappointed in, not, in it not revealing who the killer was. I had even extensively tried to surf through the internet to look up anything about who the killer might have been. But after a while and watching it again, I had come to the realization that not revealing the killer's identity was actually a great choice. And it makes the ending all the more impactful. And come to think of it, by having it not answer who the killer actually was, the filmmakers had some balls doing that. And even distributor Warner Brothers was somewhat against the ending when they were distributing it in the US. And wished to change it. I do love how it chooses not to reveal who the killer actually was now only leaving the clues for us to speculate for ourselves as to who he might be. It is only through his obscene phone calls that we are able to piece together that he somewhat refers to himself as Billy, allegedly had a sister named Agnes, and that he did something horrible to her, so much so that his parents had freaked out at him over it. But still, the fact that the film chose not to reveal the killer's true identity I believe this had helped earn the film a place in cult status among the slasher film fans. As far as should be concerned, aside from the clues to speculate from, the film ultimately depicts the killer, or Billy, as nothing more than a mere psychopathic stranger. I don't want to formally spoil how the ending goes plot-wise in this video. I really do want you to see it for yourselves, but know this, the ending does feel very much like a big 
gut puncher, but it does leave you with a set of questions and maybe even unease as the end credits continue to roll. But I do believe that this film does have an effective whodunit mystery, but one that lacks a resolution to it. The killer's identity is kept concealed. He's only mostly shown nearly out of frame, in silhouette, and sometimes only one of his eyes or hands are shown in frame, but that's about it. The film also provides us with suspects, such as some of the victim's boyfriends, mainly Peter, but in the end, it still leaves you with a big shocking gut puncher, but a very impactful one. The kill scenes are very effective and graphic as well, but also the kills are about as graphic and gory as the kills in Halloween. They do show some blood, but not that much, but the kills are really creepy to see in this film. It's really, you know, like, you know, it just really gets you under your skin in a lot of ways. Huh? So, yeah. And to say, much like Halloween, this film is very atmospheric and creepy. It relies heavily on atmosphere and suspense to fuel the scare factor, which is further helped by the ominous and unsettling music, music score by Carl Zittrer, who provides with a sense of forebodingness and unease into the film, and has a somewhat gothic feeling to it. So yeah, and this was the very first film to ever actually use the calls are coming from inside the house twist, preceding even the 1979 film, When a Stranger Calls. But in terms of genre, while many people do consider this to be one of the earlier slasher films, Bob Clark actually considers this film to be more of a psychological horror film rather than a slasher film, which is somewhat true as it does focus on foreboding atmosphere and suspense. Its kill scenes are relatively bloodless and sometimes off-screen, and it also plays with its whodunit mystery with its sus suspects and red herrings. But with that said, uh, the, you know, the, with that said, and one last interesting fact here is that this film is apparently a favorite of Elvis Presley's and Steve Martin's. Presley's tradition was to watch it every Christmas, and now his family keep the tradi tradition and watch it in his memory. And when Olivia Hussey was being cast in the 1987 film Roxanne, her co-star Steve Martin met her and said, Oh my god, Olivia, you were in one of my all-time favorite films. She thought he was referring to her 1968 film, Romeo and Juliet, but she was surprised to find out it was actually Black Christmas. Martin had even claimed that he had seen it around 27 times at, up to that point. So overall, I give Black Christmas a rating of seven stars out of ten because it is a very solid slasher film that shows death scenes in subtle bloodless ways without making them too excessive or gory it also has a number of well-known actors giving some okay performances for its subject and a very frightening slasher film who's tr who might leave you very unsettled to uh, which leaves uh, the film feeling impactful and to discuss long after the film is over. I would definitely recommend Black Christmas. If you are looking to watch a scary movie on Christmas time, or maybe watch it alongside John Carpenter's Halloween as a double feature on one random night. So thanks for what thank you for watching, ladies and gents. I will be doing more uh, more reviews during the Christmas for the Christmas season, so likely expect a review for Home Alone for this Christmas. So thanks for watching.
and until then, I will see you all next time. Merry Christmas, and peace out, everyone.